Hey guys, in this new SAT math test prep online course study guide, I'll be going over question 1 to 15 of session 4 in practice test number 1. Once again, the link is in the description below. Let's get started. Question 1. Sean runs at different speeds as part of his training program. The graph shows his target heart rate at different times during his workout. On which interval is the target heart rate strictly increasing, then strictly decreasing? Go ahead, pause the video, and try it yourself. The answer is B. To solve this question, first we have to understand what is it asking. So it's asking me you at what point on this graph is the graph strictly increasing then strictly decreasing so let's look at what it mean by increasing and decreasing so if you notice on this graph there are three part three different parts one is when we it has a positive slope the second part is when it's flat line the last part is when it's up with a negative slope so remember, slope is the formula change in y over change in x. And in this case, on the y-intercept, we have target heart rate. And on the x-intercept, we have time. So in other words, it's saying that change in y is change in the heart rate, targeted heart rate over change in time so when we have a positive slope it means is that the heart rate is increasing as time goes on and when there's a flat slope it means that the heart rate is not increasing as time goes on and when we have a negative slope in this case in this case and in this case it means the heart rate is decreasing as time goes on. So looking at this, the only time really when the heart rate is strictly increasing and then strictly decreasing is at this point here. It's when time is between 40 and 60. Hence the answer B. Question two, if Y is equal to KX, where k is a constant and y is equal to 24 when x is equal to 6, what is the value of y when x is equal to 5? Go ahead, pause this video and try it yourself. The answer is C. We know what y and x is. Then we can solve for k, and once we know what k is, we can put x is equal to 5 into this equation and solve for y. y is equal to kx when y is equal to 24 and we know x is 6. So divide 6 on both sides. 4 is equal to k. So let's rewrite the equation as y is equal to 4x. And what we want to know what y is when x is equal to 5. So y is 4 times 5 is 20. So that's our answer. And if you wanted to solve this faster, another method that we can do is proportion. y equal to kx. When y is 24, x is equal to 6. And we want to know what y is when x is equal to 5. And if you know, this is actually just a proportion question. So we can cross multiply. So this multiply here, this multiply here. We have y times k times 6. So y times k times 6 is equal to 24 times k times 5 
and we can simply cancel out k on both sides and divide a 6 on both sides so y is equal to this top here is just 4 times 5 and so y is 20 Question 3. In the figure above, line L and M are parallel and line S and T are parallel. If the measure of angle 1 is 35 degree, what is the measure of angle 2? Go ahead, pause this video and try it yourself. The answer is the line L and line M are parallel. So let's write right on here. So this are parallel. And line S and T are parallel. So that's right here. So in term, this here is actually a parallelogram. So if we know what this angle here is, then we also know that this angle here is also angle 1 because these two angles are formed by two straight lines uh, when they intersect. So this angle here is the same angle as here. And we know that when we have a parallelogram, the angle here is the same as the angle here. And the angle here is the same as the angle here. So since we know that this angle here is the same as angle one, so by default, this angle here is also the angle 1. is the same as the angle here. So since we know that this angle here is the same as angle 1, so by default, this angle here is also the angle 1. In a straight line, the degree is 180 degree. This straight line here is composed angle 2 and the angle 1 basically because we from our deduction this is the same as angle 1 so let's write is equal to angle 1 plus angle 2 and we know that angle 1 is 35 degree so let me again subtract 35 degree on both sides so this will cancel out then we have 145 degree which is equal to angle 2. And that is our answer. And another way to solve this problem is by knowing the property of par parallel line intersect by a transverse line. These two lines are parallel and is intersect by this line here. We know that this angle here is the same as this angle here. So we can write that this is also angle 1, same, same measurement. And the same thing apply here. These two are parallel line and it is intersected by this line here. So this angle here is in term the same angle as here. So this is also angle 1 and we can do the same thing uh, to solve angle 2. We, we can take 180 the degree of a straight line minus the degree of the angle 1 which will also give us question 4 if 16 plus 4x is 10 more than 14 what is the value of ax go ahead pause this video and try to solve it yourself the answer is c so let's translate this question into our equation so whenever we see is that's equal to equal whenever we see more than that means plus so if we were to translate this whole thing we can rewrite it as 16 plus 4x is so that's equal 10 more than 14 
and our goal is to find ax right uh, one way we can do it is by first solve for x and then multiply x by a so let's try that so we have 16 plus 4x is equal to 24 minus 16 on both sides and just cancel and we have 4x is equal to 8 so divide 4 on both sides then we have x is equal to 2 so ax is 8 times 2 which is equal to 16 and that's our answer question 5 which of the following graphs best show a strong negative association between d and t go ahead pause the video and try the question yourself the answer is d so to answer this question first we have to review some key concepts so what do they mean by strong and negative association so whenever we have two variable in this case d and t there's a different association between them so the first thing let's look at what do they mean by positive and negative association so positive association simply mean that when there's a positive increase in one variable we see also a positive increase in the other one in other words they increase in the same direction so like in the graph above so when d increase t also increase on the contrary negative association means when there's an increase in one variable there's a decrease in the other variable in this case when there's an increase of a variable d there's a decrease in the variable t so it will look something like this in the graph and if we were to look at this in terms of the slope in terms of the positive association the slope is a positive number and on the contrary a negative association the slope is negative and if you want to know how strong the association is so we can have a strong association and a weak association so for a strong association it simply mean that the point in on here is more closely aligned to the center line because what this is saying is that if we know a value of d we can be more surely predict what the value of t is because it's very closely uh, aligned with this straight line in the middle and in this case this is a strong positive association and then in addition when we have a couple points that's closely aligned to a negative slope line we will call that a strong negative association on the other hand a weak association is when we have point on the graph where there's not really any type of pattern to it so it could be anywhere without aligning to the center line here so as you can see each point in this case is scattered throughout the graph and what we call this is a weak positive association in addition when we have something like this where it seems like it has a negative slope but once again 
is not aligned with the center line, we call this a weak negative association. So let's look back at the question. It's asking for a strong negative association. So what that means is that because it's negative, we know the slope is negative. So out of all the answer, only answer A and answer D has a negative slope. Because look here, that's a slope. Here, that's a slope. And if we are looking at A and D, D is a stronger association because all the points are very closely aligned with this line here. Whereas in A, the points are more scattered around. So hence, D is your answer. Question six, a hospital store one type of medicine in two decagram containers. Based on the information given in the box above, how many one milligram doses are in one two decagram, decagram container? Go ahead, pause the video and try the question yourself. The answer is D. So this problem is a classic dimen dimensional analysis problem where they were first giving you one unit and they're asking you to convert to a second unit. So we know we have a box that's two decagrams. So let's let's call it decagram DG just for the sake. And gram, let's call it G. And milligram, let's call it MG. Okay, so we have a box with two DG decagram of medicine in there and the question want to know how many of one milligram are in two decagram so let's let's start out with what we have so we have two decagram and we know that one decagram is equal to 10 gram based on this first equation here and we also know that one gram is equal to 1,000 milligram based on the second equation here. So we can just multiply. So this will cancel out. The gram here will cancel out. So at the end, we have two times 10, which will give us 20 times 1,000, which the answer is 20,000 milligram, which is the answer. Question seven. The number of rooftops with solar panel installation in five city is shown in the graph above. If the total number of installation is 27,500, what is an appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph. Go ahead, pause this video and try it yourself. The answer is C. To solve this problem, we first have to really understand what this graph is saying. So the first thing when you see a bar graph on the exam is first read the title because the title will tell you a, a brief summary of what this graph is about. So the title read rooftop solar panel installations in five cities. And on the vertical axis, it's given that each of the vertical axis, each of the bar in the, on this bar graph is representing one of each city with the city A, B, C, D, and E. So we must know that on the y ax the vertical axis or y axis we can this is representing the number of insulation and the height of each graph represent how much insulation it is in each of these city um, one thing we notice is that the unit here is missing right because we know that this is the insulation but how much is each of this unit here represent? 
So let's, let's call that x. So let's say each of this space here is x. The, the problem is telling us that the total number of insulation in this five city is equal to this number. So let's, let's set our equation. So the total number is equal to 27,500. It's the total number of the insulation is the sum of the insulation in city A plus the sum of the insulation city B plus the sum in city C plus city D plus city E. And this give us 27. For city A, there is nine of this unit. So we can call this nine times X, right? Because we have nine space here and each space is X amount, X unit. So we call that nine X. Here for city B is five X. For city C is 6x, city D is 4x, and city E is 3.5x. And our goal is to solve for x because once we know what x is, then we know what is the unit uh, on, on the vertical axis. So on the equation here, a is 9x plus b is 5x plus c is 6x plus D is 4x, plus E is 3.5x, which will give us 27,500. And if we add up all the coefficient in, the, in front of the x, it will give us, remember this is a calculator session, so you can just plug all the number into your calculator, and that will actually give us 27.5 which is equal to this 27,500. And if we were to divide both sides by 27.5, x is just 1,000. And that is our answer, C, 1,000. Question number eight. For what value of n is absolute value of n minus 1 plus 1 is equal to 0. Go ahead, pause this video and try it. The answer is D. Absolute value n minus 1 plus 1, and we want to know when is it equal to 0. So next step is to isolate this absolute value sign, and minus 1 on both sides. So we have n minus 1 is equal to negative 1. And right there, we know this is not possible. Because when we take the absolute value of any number, it's always a positive number. So no matter what number n is, we can never make it equal to negative 1. So there, the answer is D. There's no such value. Question 9. Which of the following ex expresses the air temperature in terms of the speed of a sound wave? With the question, equation A is equal to 1052 plus 1 1.08 times T. In this equation, the speed of a sound wave in air depends on the air temperature. The formula above shows the relationship between A, the speed of a sound wave in feet per second, and T, the air temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Go ahead, pause this video and try it yourself. The answer is A. So what this question is asking is asking you to express air temperature, which it has a variable T, in terms of the speed of sound wave, which has a variable A. So basically, it's asking you to solve for T in terms of A. A is equal to 
1052 plus 1.08 t to solve for t so we want to move everything on the other side so let's move this 1000 on the other side first so we have a minus 1052 this cancel is equal to 1.08 t so divide both sides 0.08 this cancel so t is equal to this which is our answer question 10 at which of the following air temperatures will the speed of a sound wave be closest to 1000 feet per second go ahead pause this video and try it yourself the answer is b so this question uses the same equation from the previous uh, question so once again remember in this equation here a is the speed of a sound wave in feet per second so let's just highlight that so a is the speed of sound wave in feet per second and t is the air temperature in fahrenheit so t is the air temperature in fahrenheit so whenever you are solving for these type of equation where it involve um, units make sure the unit is it matches so in this case what is given so so what they gave us is that they want to know at this sound speed of sound wave in other words at this um, a number when it's equal to 1000 feet per second what is the te air temperature or what is t so before we do anything you have to make sure the unit matches so what they're giving you is 1000 feet per second and in the equation a is in the unit a is in the unit of feet per second so that's that's perfect we don't have to change any of the unit so because they want to know when a is 1000 what is t we can simply plug 1000 into a and then solve for t so let's write the equation here 1000 is equal to 1052 plus 1.08 times t so we can minus this number on both sides so this will give us negative 52 is equal to 1.08 t and we can just divide both sides by 1.08 1.08 this cancel and once again plug into your calculator don't try to solve it by hand because this is a calculator session so at the end you get the answer negative 48.15 Fahrenheit is equal to T so you notice none of the answer is this but remember read the question closely the question is really asking you at what temperature will it be closest it's only asking you when is it closest to 1000 so it's asking you to round this answer so when we round this 48.15 is this the, the the closest number is 48 Fahrenheit which is B question 11 which of the following numbers is not a solution of the inequality go ahead pause this video and try the question yourself so the answer is a so when before you even started i really want you to pay attention to this line here not 
So remember, the question is asking you which of the following number is is not、uh, the solution to this inequality. So don't get that confused, because oftentimes I can guarantee you on the answer here. There will be a couple answer that is the solution, and they will put it there to just trick you. So to solve for an inequality basically is asking us to solve for x. So let's solve for x. So we have three x minus five is greater than or equal to four x minus three. So we can first sub subtract x from one side. So we can minus three x on both side. This cancel. So we have minus five is greater than or equal to x minus three, which then we can add three on both side. Then we have negative two is greater than or equal to x. As this cancel, and I always like to write. My x on the other side, so it's easier for me to see. So we can rewrite this as x is less than or equal to negative two. And to help you see this easier, let's draw a number line with negative two here. So x is less than. So whenever x is less than, we go this way. So we have a solid dot here because we have this equal sign here, and it's less than, so it go this way. So now remember the question is asking you which of the following is not. So right off the bat, if you look at answer A, negative one, negative one is right here. We know right off of the bat this is does not is not one of the solution. Whereas negative two, yes, negative two is here. Negative three is here. Negative five is here. So everything else are the solution except negative one. So that's your answer A. One reminder is to to remind you is that whenever we are solving for inequality and we are multiplying or dividing by a negative number, we have to flip the sign. Let me show you what I mean by that. In case you you want a, a quick review,、um, so when we are solving for this problem, three x minus five, four x minus three. So let's say instead of subtracting three on both sides first, let's let's just subtract four on both sides. So we have. Minus four x minus four x. So this cancel out. So we have here negative one x minus five is greater than or equal to negative three. And to isolate the, the x, we can move the negative five on the other side. So plus five on both side. So this will cancel. So we have negative one x. Is greater than or equal to two, and to solve for x, we have to divide both sides by negative one. And remember, when we are dividing or, or multiplying the inequality by a negative number, we have to flip this、um, inequality sign. So now this will cancel out. Now instead of writing x is less than Or instead of writing x is greater than or equal to negative two, because remember when we're dividing negative number, it, it flips. So we have x now becomes less than or equal to negative two. So this part here, remember, it flips, which is the same thing as what we solve on here. Question twelve. Based on the histogram of the following, which is closest to the average arithmetic mean number of seeds per apple? Once again, pause this video and try the question yourself. 
The answer is C. So the question is asking us to solve the average or arithmetic. So as a reminder, the definition of average is sum of each part divided by number of part. So in this case, it's asking us the sum of, of the seats and the per apple, so the number of apple. So, and we already know what number of apple is, right? Because to remember to understand what a graph is saying, the first thing that we want to read is the title. So the title is number of seed in each of the 12 apples. So we know there are 12 apples and each apple has different number of seeds. For example, when we are looking at this histogram, we know that two apple has three seeds, four apple has five seeds, and so forth and so on. So how do we find the sum of each seed? Um, to do so, we simply multiply. So we know that there are two apple that has three seed. So these two apple will have six seed plus four apple with five seed. So we have four apple with five seeds, which this will give us 20 seed plus one apple with six seeds, so we have one apple with six seeds, which this here will give us six, plus two apple with seven seeds, so we have two apple with seven seeds, this here will give us 14, plus three apple with nine seeds, so three apple with nine seeds, which here we give us 27. And we are dividing the whole thing, remember by number of part, in this case, the number of apple, which is 12. So we are dividing this by 12. And once again, plug this all in into your calculator. At the end, we will get 6.08. And once again, we have to round this answer to the nearest whole number. So that's just rounded to six, which is answer C. Question 13. A group of 10th grade students responded to a survey that asked which math course they were currently enrolled in. The survey data were broken down as shown in the table. Which of the following categories account for approximately 19% of all the survey respondents? Go ahead, pause this video and try it yourself. The answer is C. To solve this question, we first have to understand this whole table. What this table is saying is that in the first box, is telling us that there are 35 female students taking algebra 1, this box 44 male students taking algebra 1, and total there are 79 students taking algebra 1 as the sum of these two numbers. And on this box, we have 53 female students taking geometry with 59 male students taking geometry total of 112 students taking geometry. And here we have 62 female students taking algebra 2 with 57 male students taking algebra 2, total of 119 students. And in this survey, there are 15 female with the sum of this, this, and this number that participated in this survey. And in addition, there are 160 male students and in total, there are 310 students who responded. So let's look at our question. So, so the question is asking us, 
which category, which one of this box is approximately 19% of all the survey respondents. So they want to know what is 19% of the, all the survey respondents is 310. And we want to know what's 19% of 310. So whenever we are calculating the percentage of a number, we can rewrite the percentage as, in this case is 19 over 100 times whatever the number is, in this case is 310. If we plug it into our calculator, it will come out to be very close to 59. And the only category has that number is this, this box right here, which correspond to the male student taking geometry, which would give us the answer C. Question 14. The table above lists the length to the nearest inch of a random sample of 21 brown bullhead fish. The outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error. Of the mean, median, and range of the values listed, which will change the most if the 24 inches measurement is removed from the data? Go ahead, try the question itself. All right, the answer is C. To solve this problem, let's review the basic of mean, median, and range. So let's start with the, the easiest one, range. So range is the largest number minus the smallest number. So let, let's say uh, in two scenarios, the first scenario where we have 21 uh, fish, the largest number is 24 minus eight. So in this case, it will be 24 minus eight, which is 16. And when we have 20 fish, we remove this 24, then the largest number be, becomes 16, and the smallest number remains to be 8. So we have 16 minus 8, which is 8. And the difference between them is 8. So that's the first one, range. All right, now let's look at median. So by definition, median is the number in the middle when we arrange the number from smallest to the largest. So, so let's write it down. The middle number when they are arranged from smallest to the largest. All right. So. Let's look at the sample when we have 21 fish. So when we have 21 fish, we, we have the middle number is the 11th number. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this is the, the lower 10th number. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 12 here, is the median because there are 10 number beneath these this and 10 number above this so in this case we have 12 is the median and let's look at when we have 20 fish so when we have 20 fish this get crossed out 24 get cancelled out so now we only have 20 number here so 20 number, the middle number is between 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the, the middle number is somewhere between this number and this number. And when we don't have exact number, what we do is we take the average of these two numbers. 
12 and 12. So the average of 12 and 12 is just 12. So it's the same. So in this case, the difference between them is zero. So right off the bat, we know that the answer is not median. And because of that, we also know that the answer cannot be D because D stated that the change are the same. And we know that the, the range changed by eight where the median changed by zero. So lastly, let's look at the mean. All right, like on, on the previous question, mean is sum of the parts divided by number of parts. So when we have the 21 fish sample, basically what we do is we add 8 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9 plus 10 plus 10, so forth, so on. And that will give us the sum. So that will be 8 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9, so forth, so on. Once we add every single number in the table. And how many of this uh, number are there? We have 21 number, right? So we divide the whole thing by 21. And once you plug that into your calculator, it will come out to be 262 divided by 21, which is about 12.48. And when we remove the last number, 24, we basically have, so when we cross this out, 24, we basically have 262 minus 24. Now, instead of dividing, by 21, we're dividing by 20 because right now we only have 20 number here once we take out this 24. So we divide by 20 and this becomes 238 divided by 20, which is about 11.9. And the difference here we know that is less than one. So it's less than one. So right off the bat, we know the answer is C because it, once again, cannot be, is not mean because the difference is less than one. And the here, difference is eight. Question 15, what does the C intercept represent in the graph? Once again, pause the video and try the question yourself. The answer is A. So this question is what they're really asking you is to interpret this graph and find out what does this C intercept means. So let's look at this graph. So this graph, once again, whenever you see a graph, always look at the title. So the, this graph is telling you that that's the total number of renting a boat by the hour. And on the X axis, in this case is the H axis is the time and on the y axis on in this case the c z c axis is a total cost and we want to know what is this c intercept so what intercept mean is that at the point where this line intersect with the c axis or in other words the y intercept so this point here that is our c intercept so that's our C intercept. So what does this point mean? So this point here mean is that that is the total number of costs when the time is zero. And when the time is zero, in other words, that is the initial, the initial time or the initial cost for renting a boat. And the only answer that, is, that would give us that is A the initial cost of renting the boat. And if we look at answer B, that is wrong. The total number of boat rented, no. The total number of boat rented, that has nothing to do with this graph. The graph is only 
telling us the total cost of renting a boat. So we can cross out B and C, the total number of our boat rented. Once again, the, the, there's nowhere mentioning what is the total number of hours. D, the increase in cost to rent a boat for each additional hour. What this D is saying is really asking us the slope. It's asking us for each hour increase, what is the increase in cost? So that's rise over run, rise over run. So that's the slope. So this is really asking us for the slope. So once again, this is the wrong answer. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be uploading part two, part three, part four to this series in the near future. And if you'd like to see more video like this, please consider subscribing and click the bell notification. And lastly, leave any comment feedback that you have in the comment section below. Thank you once again.